so that means m4 crosses 1, the simplest case. Uh, in here, we will have something like the, the electric field will go like 1 over the distance as I have uh, over there, 1 over the distance cube for when the distance is smaller or equal than r, where r is the radius of S1. But at the end, it will go like a 1 over r square if the distances are much greater than r. And then the reason is that we have to, have to consider that the, 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 the size of the extra dimension is very small. Then we have to compute what, say, Gauss's law will tell us about uh, the behavior of large r. And when this red distance is much bigger than the size of the extra dimension, it has to behave like a standard four dimensional um, theory. And that means they will have to go like 1 over r square. And this is one of the exercises you will have in, in, in the example sheet I gave you today. It's a very straightforward example to, to, to do this integral and get uh, um, uh, the, the right result. At the end, is, is imagine that, that you are, the circle is, is like an interval, so you put a charge over there. And then you have a bunch of circles because the, uh, sorry, uh, a bunch, bunch of intervals that uh, define the circle out of, out of the real line. So you have a charge uh, repeated many times in, 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 your, in, your, in your real line. And so at the end, the, the, what you have to compute is, is the electric field due to a, a line of charge. When you make the distance very small, so it's like you have a line of charge. And this is a very simple use of Gauss's law to get this behavior. So it's something. I would, I would encourage you to try because it's a nice exercise um, using the concepts of uh, second year of undergraduate. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, what happened in those theories where our four <coughs> space, time, space time dimensions are embedded in a higher dimensional space? What kind of behavior would we get? Oh, like in a, in a brain, you're saying? Uh, we will discuss these things later because the brain world has its, 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 its different uh, uh, behavior. But in general, um, this this will be an extra. Uh, this will be a simple extra dimension where you, we just where we're leaving every all the dimensions are are treated equally. So we are not just separated in, in, in the brain. You have uh, uh, if, if the standard model if we live on a brain, then uh, depending on which force we are talking about, we will get the one over r square behavior or one over r cube. For instance. You're, we're living in a D3 brain, a D3 brain. So that means our, for every, uh, the electromag electromagnetic field is inside the brain also. So then you will get the standard four-dimensional behavior for electromagnetism. But for gravity, gravity will be an extra dimension, so gravity will fill the extra dimensional part, so it will behave differently. And so you, you have to, to separate both. Good point, yes? What would happen if we had a second time dimension? That's a very difficult question, yes. Usually, people just do not consider extra dimensions. Uh, there's a problem with causality and, and uh, all those things. So, that's, that's a, you try to do a quantum field theory of that, you will have problems with ghosts and so on. Um, but it's, it hasn't stopped people from thinking about it once and again. So, that there's always this idea that you can have an extra time, and probably you can compactify this extra time dimension and these kind of things. Uh, it's, it's open to debate, but it's usually, it's very, very difficult to keep a, a consistent theory so that you keep causality and so on, and you have several times. So that's why we are all respect to extra special dimensions. But it's a good question, very good. Can one make the theory in which little r is field dependent, e dependent? Little r is e dependent. E dependent. It, it means on the electric field. That depends on the electric field. I would say the other way around because little light is. Uh, we will move on because you will see that. But little light is defining the geometry, and then the fields will be functions of the of the space time. So at the end, that you don't have, you cannot go uh, back. But uh, there will be all, there can be also nonlinear theories where uh, things will will look like that more or less because then the kinetic terms will not be standard and so on. But uh, probably we will we will get clear when we see the Kaluza Klein later. Well, very good. So, so that's an, uh, uh, another of the properties of, uh, that we, we get from, uh, 
from vector fields. And uh, <coughs> another one, yes? Yes, I think so. Yes, yes, that's true. So whenever you go be, uh, for this and much larger than R, the extra dimensions uh, are essentially you don't see them. So. Yes, very good point. Good. So um, <coughs> another property which uh, m makes a difference between uh, within within the 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 four dimension and the extra dimensions is that. Uh, <coughs> One little thing. One is that, is that, as I told you here, here, uh, the spin in four dimensions, essentially you see a vector and you say, well, it has spin one. That's more or less clear. That's a, you see a vector, probably you have to complicate a bit because you have to, it has to be, come from the one zero plus zero, one representation of the uh, Poincare group that gives you the F mu, but the F mu at the end will be the, the D of A and A. Is, uh, has carrying one index that tells you that you have a spin one. Here, this subject carries one index, but it may have a spin one or a spin zero. So the spin is not, is not a well-defined quantity. So a spin we define it as, 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 as a four-dimensional uh, um, concept. And, uh, but in general, you can define more general uh, spin. So you can see that in this, we didn't have the problem with the scalar, because the scalar was a spin zero in both cases. But here, we start looking that the, there are several spins coming out, out of a single object. And uh, to define spin, and we, we will use this later, notice the following. We have to go back to the Poincare group algebra. And of course, I never remember the the order of the indices, so I will I wrote it here to be R mu sigma. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I got it wrong. This was in 4D. And at the end, we define the spin. Spin, remember, uh, in terms of, of the, of the um, operator ji to be epsilon ijk mjk. Essentially, I forgot if there was a factor of i or not here. I don't never remember. But essentially, ji is related to mjk. So j1 is m23, and so on. And this is OK. So uh, in, in, uh, for a massless particle, where the momentum was chosen to be, say, E, E, 0, 0. And when we saw, well, this is the, the corresponding uh, uh, little group was O2, then the, the spin was essentially related to M2, 3. And M23 is the, is the, um, is the thing. So at the end, the eigenvalue of this operator M23, that will, is the thing that will give you uh, the spin. OK? Or the helicity in the, in, for the massless case. So, uh, and so it was clear that whenever you have a, 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 a field, you can see how, how this generator, which is the generator of this O2, will act on that, and that will define your, your spin. In uh, higher dimensions,
Why is that O2 and not SO2? I forgot, huh? I forgot. Let me see. Yes, uh, someone remember? Is it a problem if we make a reflection here? Reflection would be an example of a transformation which is in O2 but not in SO2. Um, would that cause any trouble here? No, but uh, the things that are. Well, this, these things we saw from the algebra. And from the algebra, um, that on, that's the continuous part. So probably that must, that doesn't make a difference, as you say, yeah? because the algebra is uh, yes, the reflections will be doing things which are not uh, infinitesimal. Yes, so probably that doesn't make a difference. So that that's that's a, that's a good question. It's a, yes, did, did I say O2 or O2 at the beginning of my course? I I now, I now forgot. Someone remembers? Okay. Yes. <laughs> anyway, I don't have the notes now. So let, let, let's, let's move on. So <clears throat> in, in, uh, in high dimensions, there are two, two different things. One is that, for instance, now you can choose the, the center of mass momentum for, for a, a massless object to be EE e and then zeros and a bunch of zeros. And uh, and then the group here will be either SO or O2, OD minus 2. Model of the question, sorry. And uh, notice also that there is a different thing here, is that uh, remember I told you that the little group was not O2, but was actually the Euclidean group in two dimensions. It was a bigger thing. And at some point we just uh, restrict to the representation to be finite dimensional, and we ended up with a smaller little group, O2. Okay. The same thing happens here. The, the little group will be something much bigger, like a generalization of the Euclidean group in higher dimensions. However, by the same requirement, I notice that the same requirement is that you want uh, finite dimensional representations, you restrict only to the OD minus 2 part of that little group. Uh, <coughs> This I personally don't feel very comfortable because in four dimensions it was a very, very clear uh, question. Is it, if we have the Euclidean group, that will imply an extra uh, continuum degrees of freedom, degree of freedom, and, and a continuum level for a particle that we, we haven't seen experimentally. So it is an experimental constraint that says, well, we restrict to the O2 case because we don't have uh, any, any extra continuum level for the particles. In extra dimensions, it's hard to use an experimental argument to restrict something. People, people use it somehow, still. And that, I, I, for, I challenge you to find a better explanation. I don't find it myself. And there may be, a form, I, it can be room for extra, for extra properties here. So that's, that's something I would like to, to raise to you if you have, uh, you come up at some point in your career with this point, it will be nice. <coughs> uh, but still people re restrict to OD, OD minus two. And then, in general, look at, uh, look at uh, uh, what happens now. You, the algebra is similar. Algebra is, is like, a, like, a, like the, the, the 4D case, except for the indices now just go wrong from, uh, uh, just, so just change mu and nu and rho sigma, just change into m, n, p, and s, say. And, uh, and uh, the algebra will be the same. But now, <coughs> something will happen that is, notice that m, for instance, m2, 3, m2, 3 commutes with m4, 5, and, uh, and, with, and also with m6, uh, 7, and so on. You look at the algebra, you start changing i, i plus 1, the, because of these etas, they will always give you 0. Okay, so 
<coughs> so the i, i plus 1, and j, j plus 1, and so, so then you have, each of them will give you different spins. And the eigenvalues of that will give you different spins. So at the end, you define the spin as a maximum eigenvalue of any of the m i i plus 1 generators. Okay. So that's the definition of spin. So the, the, the point here is the maximum, maximum. So in, uh, for instance, in the case of when you have a, <coughs> a vector field that decomposes in a vector and a bunch of scalars, at the end, the maximum spin, you, will not, you know it will always be the spin one that you will get in four dimensions. So that is one comment. Uh, the other comment is now that we are here, is that the number of degrees of freedom You count for a vector in 4D, you take a mu, go to the, go to the little group representation, that will be in AI, where I equals to, say, 2 and 3. These two entries here, or there. And so then you count how many degrees of freedom you have there, 1 and 2. So that, that tells you two degrees of freedom. Okay, so those are the degrees of freedom, the two polarizations of the photon. That's, that's, is, that's the way of counting the number of degrees of freedom. So two polarizations of the photon. Uh, <coughs> In, in, in higher dimensions, you have the AIs, but now I goes from 1 up to uh, d minus 2. So that means that it has d minus 2 degrees of freedom. Okay. This is easy to see, for instance, for the five-dimensional case, it will have five minus two equals three degrees of freedom. That means that two corresponds to the photon and one to the scalar. Okay, so that, that, that fits very well. Two for this and one for that. Okay, and then you have more dimensions, you have more, more scalars, and they will complete the number of degrees of freedom. Another comment is duality. In 4D, we have the, the, the Maxwell field. Is, you can define is the dual of the Maxwell field. F mu nu dual is like epsilon mu nu rho sigma F rho sigma. And this was interesting because uh, um, Essentially, you, can, you have Maxwell's equations There were d mu f mu nu equal to zero in vacuum, of course. This was the Maxwell equation, and the other one was um, d mu If, um, what is that you can write, uh, well, F tilde. <laughs> These are the Bianchi identities. So you have seen this before, I'm sure. This is the Maxwell, equa uh, the Maxwell equations, and this is the corresponding Bianchi identity that defined at the end of four Maxwell's equations. And under duality, so this is the field equation. 
ambient identity. This duality, if you change f to f dual, implies that the field equations are exchanged with the Bianca identities. And still you have uh, the same, essentially the same theory, because you exchange this by that, and the same thing. So that this is the, what is called electromagnetic duality. So that means that you could have started, instead of starting with f, you could have started with f tilde. And, uh, and of course it's called electromagnetic duality because changing f to f tilde is changing electric and magnetic fields. In 5D, now this thing changes a lot. Because you, if you start with f mu nu, you want to define f mu nu, f mu nu uh, the, the tilde of f mu nu, uh, then it has to have an extra index, because the epsilon has five indices now. So you define the tilde, the, the dual of, of, uh, of f, it will be epsilon mu nu rho sigma uh, alpha, f sigma alpha, so that means that this subject has three indices. So now, this is not an electromagnetic field. If this is an electromagnetic field, this is not. So there is no duality. There is duality, but to a different level. So now you are mapping two different things. Before, you were mapping a two-index guy to another two-index guy, and so you can change by one by the other one. So it was a self-dual situation. Here, you don't have a self-dual because you start with a two-index object and you end up with a three-index object. Still, both theories, if you start with this or start with that, are equivalent. Okay, so that is nice. So that tells you that if you start with a, uh, an, an object with one index, which is the vector, the field strain will have two indices, that will be equivalent to a start with an object with two indices and the field strain with three indices. Okay. So that, that, that is nice. And that, uh, uh, I will ask you to prove this equivalence. There is a very nice way to, to, to prove the equivalence between these two theories in general. Uh, and uh, uh, it also introduces the new objects for you. And the new objects for you are anti-symmetric tensors with many indices. In four dimensions, we're only used to the scalar uh, vector, and then we go to the metric, which is symmetric. We, we, then, we, then, we don't go to the anti-symmetric tensors. Here, they come out, they come out naturally because of the duality with, 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 a, with, a, um, with, with the electromagnetic field. Furthermore, you can start asking, oh, are they, this, all these higher dimensional, higher order anti-symmetric tensors always equivalent to something we know? And the question is, yes in four dimensions, yes in five, but not in six and up. Why? Because in six and up, you start with an object with uh, two indices. The dual of that will be an object with two indices also. So, so it's different from electromagnetic field and so on. You look confused, so it's great. That's what I wanted. Okay. <clears throat> in general, in general, you can start with any object. You can start with anti-symmetric tensor. which is A, M1, all the way to M, and I call P plus 1, just for, for fun. This will define a field strain, M1 to M, P plus 2, equals to the dM1 of A, M2, plus two, uh, anti-symmetric, just F, t I'm sorry, without the tilde. F will be the derivative of A, anti-symmetric part, okay? This, this is, will be the field strength of this corresponding field. And in D dimensions, 
then you can define the dual of f, which will be an object with m1 to m d minus p minus, minus uh, two entries. And this will be epsilon m1 all the way to md times f um, m d minus p minus 2 all the way to md. Okay, so I think I am right yes. for, for a change. The sum, the sum of the number of indices of f tilde and f have to be the total dimensions because they are contracted by the epsilon index. But I think that's why this has, has to be d minus p minus 2, and this one has to have all the way to d. Okay, so you have this duality, and, and, and uh, uh, so that means that you, you start <coughs> With this object, you always end up with that object. For instance, me. yes? I think you contract uh, the index m, d minus p minus 2. On the right hand side, you contract that index, uh, but on the left hand side, it still appears as a one. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, yes. I wasn't right after all. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. So okay, so the, so this this you have this duality. So this is which is a generalized duality. Examples of this. Take d equals to 4 again. So we already know, we already know the f menu to f tilde menu. That's okay. But we could have started with an object with uh, three indexes in, in three dimensions, in four dimensions. So f menu row, which is equal to the derivative of an uh, antisymmetric tensor. This will be dual to an f tilde with only one index, because the sum of the two indices has to be 4. So m tilde, which is epsilon sigma mu nu rho, f mu nu rho. And f tilde of sigma, then it will be itself the derivative of something, so this sigma of a scalar. So this is telling us that you start with an antisymmetric tensor of two indices, this is equivalent to a scalar. Okay. What's the measure again? Uh, I want it to be an A. Yeah. So that's why we don't say, we usually don't talk about anti-symmetric tensors with two indices in four dimensions, because we can, by this transformation we can dualize to a scalar. Okay. Very good. And but you start, for instance, take d equal to six, and then d equal to six, you start with a f. Take take three objects, three indices. So you still need d equals four. D equals four. These two examples. Yeah. D equal to six. Then I start with say f. M and P, this will be DM, B and P. This will be equivalent to an F tilde which is equal to epsilon M and, I'm oh, sorry, QRS, sorry, QRS, M and P. QRS, 
f m m n p. And again, this is the derivative. This has two indices, so it has the derivative of another b hat, say, r s. So this is telling us that an antisymmetric tensor of two indices is dual to an antisymmetric tensor of two indices. So now we have to make sense out of these objects. Antisymmetric tensors have a life by themselves. They don't depend on the thing that we know already. Okay? And the and, uh, interesting thing about them is that they all carry a spin less or equal than one, according to the definition of a spin that I told you. So antisymmetric tensors, if we are restricted to theories with half, which have uh, a spin less than two, we have to include antisymmetric tensors because these objects carry spin, spin of order one or less. One way to see it is that you start, for instance, start with this, uh, start with six in 6D with B, M, N, and this will go, we can decompose it, this will be B, mu, rho. So now M, N are from 1 to 6, uh, from 0 to 5, sorry. So B, mu, rho, which is the, the standard B, mu, rho, and then the, it will have also B, mu, 5, and b mu 6, these are two vectors, and then there will be b 5, 6. Okay, so this is, this as I told you is a scalar in, two, in four dimensions. Because of what I, I just showed you that the antisymmetric tensor in four dimensions is equal to a scalar. These are two vectors in 4D, and this it's just scalar in 4D. Okay. So, <clears throat> so you can see you can uh, see it from from the um, okay and, and sorry and the number of degrees of freedom. So again, you go to the little group. And then, so you, have, you start with an object, let's uh, say m1 to mp plus 1. So this will go to, uh, in the little group, it will be i1, i, p plus 1, where now i, n, I just go from 1 to d minus 2, which is the, the dimensionality of the, of the little group. And so the number of independent components will be the number, so no, the number of degrees of freedom are just the number of components of this object in the little group. Uh, and, and so that will be an object, um, you start with a d minus 2, and then you have p plus 1 indices. D of F, degrees of freedom. The sentence, yes. In order to study the number of degrees of freedom, you have to study, uh, you have to, to consider the little group, and then see how the antisymmetric tensor, uh, write the components of the tensor in the, in, the, in the components of the little group. Remember that the little group is, is the thing that has zero, zero, zeros, and the, when I wrote, I erased it. I wrote the, <laughs> Here is for you. <laughs> okay, this, this, this is the little group is O d minus two. So I have, I have to write. I have to see how this object transforms because I'm in the center of mass of the corresponding massless particle and see how it transforms with respect to the to the things that I can rotate freely. And these are the O d minus two. Question. Why is something with two free uh, four dimensional indices a scalar in four D? Precisely because I just show uh, prove it to you here. Yeah. Scalar. 
B56, oh, very good. Why is B56 a scaler? Because it carries no indices in four dimensions. This is just a scalar. If you, if you're sitting from five dimensions, from four dimensions, this object has no indices, no, no space time indices. It's the same thing, the same reason that I have the row of, uh, when I do compose a, a n into a mu and row, a mu was a vector and row was a scalar because it was the a5 component. So according to the four dimensions, it, it has no space time indices. Ah, so, so the attempt to uh, write it like that breaks down. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Good, good. You're with me. Great. Yes? Yes, exactly. Very good, very good. So what you do? This this so this fields. This fields have. The corresponding Lagrangian for this field would be say one over g squared times d b. So this is this is the, the F square. So this this is the generalized Maxwell Lagrangian. And uh, so what I'm proving about duality this is, is to tell you that this is dual to the Lagrangian, which is proportional to D B uh, dual. So M1 to M2 M D minus P minus 2 square. <clears throat> okay, and if you do the exercise, you can see that this one over g square goes to positive g square. And this is the nice thing that this duality means a weak to a strong coupling. This is the duality that I was telling you in the past. Okay, you, st you, do, do, you start with electromagnetism, you, you will do it. You will see. It is, there is an exercise in the example sheet. Please do it. It's a very interesting example. And that's precisely what we ask you to do. Start with this theory and derive this theory by doing a simple duality transformation. This is two lines, three lines exercise. OK, just let me finish this. Uh, this is that the anti-symmetric tensors have another property. We know that electromagnetic fields couple to, to particles. And the way to see it is that they, you can write this coupling. OK. Where, where this x mu will define the world line of your particle. And so you can contract the, the vector of, 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 of your position of the particle with the, with the corresponding uh, vector of, of the electromagnetic field. And that's the way a particle couples say to, to an electromagnetic field. Then you can generalize this. So, so then take a two index object. This will couple then to something that carries two dimensions. So that means that B mu nu couples to something that has two special dimensions and time. And that's precisely a string. OK, so this object is important for a string. So this is the, that's the thing that a string is charged under. An object with the three indices, then an anti-symmetric tensor with three indices, will couple to a membrane and so on. And so on. So an object with P plus one indices. In, in D dimensions, M1, M2, M, P plus 1, 
it will couple to an object with p plus one. P plus one indices, and this is what is called a p brain. Okay, so a p brain is essentially an object with p special dimensions. That is the the plus one that I was I keep, I keep adding here just to have the time. So the p brain is an object with with a p dimensions in a, in in, in a, inside a d-dimensional space. Okay, so the natural thing that couples to them. Being this the volume element of that object is an antisymmetric tensor with p plus one indices. So th that's that's why these antisymmetric tensors are so important. Okay, and as I told you, they are uh, uh, general extensions of the Maxwell field. And, um, and and so and they couple to extended objects. So that's the way of introducing uh, p brains. So uh, this, I think, will I fin finish. Uh, so I have covered just to give you where we're going. I covered spin zero, which is scalar. I covered you all the spin ones, which now is on not only electromagnetic fields but also all these anti-symmetric tensors in any dimensions. And then, so the only thing I'm left is to cover spin two, which will be the metric, and then fermions. Okay, so that will do. We will be doing next. <laughs>